You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Monster House presents Monster Talks, a proud member of the Airwave Media Podcast Network, home of such shows as Kick Ass News, Movie Therapy, and Therapist Uncensored. If you'd like to advertise on this show, contact sales at advertisecast.com. For most of us, smartphones are with us all day, every day. But are they listening to everything we say? That's a good question. My phone is spying on me. My phone is listening to my conversations. Like, this is creepy. I was like, man, I really want some beer. And once you know it, I got an ad for a beer company. Has this ever happened to you? They're listening to your phone as you're having a conversation. You think? Yes. Companies have had to deny it. Uh, yes or no, does Facebook use audio attain, obtained from mobile devices to enrich personal information about its users? No. Well, Senator, let, let me be let me be clear on this. I mean, so you're, you're talking about this um, conspiracy theory that gets passed around that we listen to what's going on on your microphone and use that for ads. Right. We don't do that. It's actually quite unlike anything we've ever seen before. A giant hairy creature, part ape, part man. In Loch Ness, a 24-mile-long bottomless lake in the highlands of Scotland, it's a creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Monster Talk. Welcome to Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. I'm Blake Smith. And I'm Karen Stolzner. Hey there, Monster Talkers. Hopefully I haven't bitten off more than I can chew with this topic. Like a lot of the things we cover, there may not be a simple binary answer to this one. What we're going to be talking about is whether our phones are listening to us. Now, on the one hand, we know that they are technically listening. If you have an Android phone, for example, new models actively listen and identify background music without the need to launch an app like Shazam. And we're all familiar with audio internet devices from Apple, Google, and Amazon that sit around passively listening for command words. But when you get a weird ad for Peruvian mangoes after you just mentioned to your friends that your uncle moved to Peru to grow mangoes, well... The obvious conclusion is that your device was listening and found an ad that matched your conversational interest. It makes sense on the surface, but is that really what's going on? Are they actively listening to us all the time? That's what we'll be discussing today on Monster Talk. Karen, have you ever talked about something only to then see an ad about it on your phone shortly after that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's happened a lot. And what, what, what was your initial thought when that happened? What, what did you think about it? Well, uh, I just assumed that uh, my phone was listening to me. Tell you, I mean, this has happened lots of times. It seems to have happened to everyone that I know as well. Me too. Uh, for example, uh, Matt and I were talking about something pretty obscure, talking about the Moai statues on Easter Island and how we'd love to travel there someday. It's one of the most remote places on earth uh, so just a very specific thing to be talking about and later on that day we hopped in the car and then easter island pops up on apple maps so <laughs> it's like they rap a newie about it already yeah oh, nice <laughs> very nice but i've talked about all kinds of things with friends and family from sunscreens to restaurants or health issues for example the other day was talking with Matt about moles, skin moles, and then suddenly ads are popping up on my phone and my computer, and it's uh, really strange. It is strange, yeah, yeah. It, it, when it, people talk about it, they say, "Oh, our phones are listening, smartphones are listening," and uh, you know, I I guess I assumed on some level that that was true, without yeah. really thinking about it too much. And don't feel bad because I'm an IT professional and have been for most of my adult life, uh, 
at mm-hmm. least since 95. Really a little bit before that, before the Navy, I did some IT work. And then after the Navy, more. But the uh, e- even in my career, in my, in my profession, I run into people who fervently believe that our phones are listening to us all the time. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I thought we it's an interesting topic. Um, and I wasn't sure if there was a way to cover it with under, under the, uh, uh, the auspices of Monster Talk. But I think it kind of mm. fits into the... You know, conspiracy is, theory, conspiracy theory, AI Thinking. is Big Brother watching us. There's a lot of you know things going on there, and um, I, I oh, think I... In, in the cool. funny, the funniest part is I believed it too until mm. I kind of really thought it through. Um, yeah, yeah. There, so I'm glad yeah. you've done this this research and into this. And so you, you mentioned Big Brother watching us. So I'm wondering, is there a difference between us being watched and us being listened to? Well, yes, there is. In fact, I think that's the key. It's it's mm. amusing to me. And, and again, it's extremely intuitive because if we think about humans, which we are, uh, I assume most of our listeners are also, um, the, <laughs> we, we get a lot of our information through sight and through sound. And it's really mm. natural for us to assume that if someone else knows something, they either heard it or they read mm-hmm. it, you know, so... Uh, the, the idea that our phones would listen to us um, is is not a big stretch, um, mm-hmm. but but I, but I it would kinda, be yeah. something to be concerned about if that was the case. Yeah, it would be. So I, I think what, one of the things that made me start to like look into this was what would it take computationally to listen to everybody's conversations. This actually. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this, but in in the early 2000s, there was kind of a big scandal when it was publicly revealed that uh, the CIA was implementing a system that was called Carnivore that was going to allow Mm. the CIA to sort of listen in or monitor everyone's Internet uh, and possibly telephone uh, access. So. Okay, I'm not really familiar with it. I was still in Australia then. Yeah, it kind of it kind of blew up, and when it was revealed, I think a lot of t- sort of security, you know, infosec people thought, well, if this has been revealed, something better's already come along. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. when they reveal a, a, a secret aircraft, you you got to assume something better is already out there. You know, that, sure. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's that's probably not true e- either, but it is an mm-hmm. assumption many people make. You know. I, it, well, it, yeah, fairly I mean, recently, not... they, they did a U-2 flight for some stuff. And I was like, they're still flying the U-2? So, I mean, maybe that's a bad mm-hmm. assumption as well. <laughs> well, look, I, I think it's kind of like people discovering chupacabras uh, or coming across creatures that are, are dead and uh, believing that they've been drained of blood by aliens, that kind of thing. If you're not familiar with how these things happen, if you're not familiar with technology, how these things work, I think – It's easy to make assumptions, but I think the real reason or one of the reasons that everyone is talking about this and thinking about this is that it's promulgated by the media. Oh, it most certainly is. Yeah. And, you know, the media doesn't do a great job. I I think we've talked about this before on the show, and and I don't mean this in a kind of casual, you know, the media is partisan. I mean (laughs) – newspapers really don't do what we think they do. Like there's this sort of, I think a lot of people, especially my age, um, kind of remember Watergate and Mm -hmm. how the newspapers brought down, you know, an administration by revealing secrets and, uh, you know, just basically showing that um, there was power in the media to, to make change, Mm -hmm. you know, but, but mm-hmm. but most of the time when we think about when we talk about it, it was like, well, there was a ghost story and the media had covered it very credulously or they played the yes. X-Files music and talked about it on TV. They did no journalism. Yeah. Well, absolutely. But yeah, just sensationalism. In the past couple of weeks, there's been a news story about the Russians possibly having a nuclear device in space. And it's like a big security thing. And I heard NPR coverage about it. And the reporter who was covering it, you know, instead of saying what was going on or what we know and what we don't know, he made some kind of comment about, well, it's not a bomb, so it's probably some other nuclear thing. I don't know what that means. Well, Mm. isn't that the job of journalism to find out what it means, not to make jokes about it? Uh, Well, I guess in in 
investigative journalism, yeah, maybe. It, it, in, <laughs> not for many journalists. And, and to be read. fair, that's not how that works. What actually happens is they now you can definitely see it when you go to any news site. You know, most of the website is covered with ads that aren't even from that place, and a lot of them are fake and look like news stories, but are really advertising. Mm. So it's very deceptive. And the whole oh, clickbait. Yeah. yeah, it is difficult for people to tell, uh, especially if you're not so, familiar with that. Yeah, so, and I know we've got really good friends who are journalists, uh, and like David Perlmutter at, at Texas Tech in Lubbock. Uh, but you, so the point is, you know, you want journalism to be this exalted, truth finding, uh, mm. you know, uh, institution like a, a part of a free mm-hmm. society really depends on a free press, but the free press is not free. It depends on advertising, which is completely mm-hmm. tied into what this episode's really about. It's about how mm-hmm. that this pursuit of details and information about consumers has changed the way that we consume media. And mm-hmm. it's incredibly powerful, but what it's powerful at is getting information about what we look for, not necessarily what we want, which I find interesting. Right. Well, yeah, and I think that there are parallels, too, with a lot of modern journalism and uh, just the retelling of folklore. Mm-hmm. You know, we, when we talk about ghost stories or paranormal claims and you go and look them up online from Wikipedia through to people's blogs uh, through to journalism – Often there's just a retelling of the story rather than doing any research, any investigation. So it is a a problem. But I think particularly with something like this, which can, I, I guess, you know, ultimately be uh, dangerous to to believe in something that that's not real. It could lead to a lot of paranoia if if it were real. I I, I think. We all have these sort of anecdotes, and there's that other concept they call the availability heuristic, where you can think mm-hmm. of an example, and that's more powerful than the actual statistics. So mm-hmm. you can remember one case, right? You remember one story about somebody uh, having a, a dangerous person show up in their back seat. You know, it's an extraordinarily rare occurrence that someone would break into a car, hide in the back seat, right? But that is or a vanishing so, hitchhiker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's so pervasive as a concept that we all think it happens all the time, even though it's extraordinarily rare. You know, the, we are one of those friend of a friend things. Yep, also true. Mm-hmm. So I guess well, let's dig yeah, into this, this exactly. these claims because again, I hear uh, these all the time, and a, again, I don't think I applied too much thought to it. I just assumed that there was something going on uh, regarding marketing, and I didn't pay it too much attention, but I think it's definitely worth uh, addressing. Yeah, I, I guess we should say, uh, you know, and I'm uh, I'm not in the clickbait world, and I don't like the clickbait world, and so – Nor do I. I, I <laughs> if, we, if we title this episode, Is Your Phone Listening to You?, I would want to lead with no. No, it's not. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but let me explain uh, why people think that it is, you know. Can we kind of go back to, to where this began? Do we know what the source of, of this these claims are? Yeah, that's a really good question. I it, it certainly came up around the twenty sixteen election because there were a lot of people concerned about the power of Facebook. And I, I do wanna mm. say this is uh, one of those topics that covers every internet platform. This is not mm-hmm. exclusive to social media. It also feeds into search. It feeds into what your ISPs can do. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, I guess the thing is that in order to send information on the internet, um, you're sending it from your computer out mm-hmm. through your router across multiple other devices to the destination, whatever that may be, whether it's another app or it's a query to a service or whatever. So Mm -hmm. all across that process, there's logs being generated. People are monitoring. Uh, It's not like an individual is sitting there reading all your stuff, but they're collecting as much data as they can, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to websites, um, you know, you always get those little notices now, thanks to Europe, uh, the, you know, do you accept the cookies? Um, so mm-hmm. if you don't know what cookies are, the internet itself, the HTTP <laughs> stuff like that. Or that, if you think they're cookies, right. chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> if you, nom, 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 nom. You know, yes, cookies. I accept. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but they, the basically the internet as it was originally designed in the old Tim Berners Lee sort of world uh, is what they call stateless, which is to say that you send a query, it pulls back the information, and that's it. You doesn't you don't, you're not keeping a session open. You're not in like it's mm-hmm. different from say Telnet or other kind of sessions where you're actively sending information back and forth. The internet's a pull, and so. Mm-hmm. From the very early days of the internet, people wanted it to do more than just passively share information. So really early on, they figured out how to like make it do more. And all these ways of extending it, I guess the first thing was uh, CGI, the Common Gateway Interface, where it was like a little folder that you could put programs in that would do more than HTTP would, but it would like... Like it would take the HTTP information you were sending and then it would process it and do something with it and then send back the static data as part of the re- response. And so as far as the browser is concerned, you know, it looks like a static piece of information. But reality was more than just a browser or web server was at play there. There was other programs at play. But mm-hmm. it needed to do more. So they developed this JavaScript software, which allowed – pages to do all kinds of fancy stuff, which has grown from just being able to look pretty to doing quite elaborate programmatical things. In fact, if uh, mm-hmm. there's most browsers allow you to stick a little extension in that will turn off uh, JavaScript. And if you do, many parts of the internet just break. They don't work anymore because <laughs> that's not what's actually happening. You're not seeing the same page everyone else does. You're getting personalized data based on your previous mm-hmm. experiences. Um, all right. So along that process, as it's trying to personalize, it needs to keep information about who you are. And you might say in a benign way, you know, I want to remember that I've chosen to change my font to look like this. And I want to remember that when I log in, I want to go to this page. You know, whatever like little personalized settings, the the cookie helps identify you to the site. But it also provides them with tons of information for ad tracking. So most of the Okay, so what kind of information are we talking about? Well, it varies depending on how much access you give. A lot of sites allow you to opt out for certain parts of it or uh, granularly say yes or no. Some don't. Uh, when Every time you install Windows, for example, if you like do Windows 11, or even if you get a big update after you've already made these decisions, they will say, we're improving Windows. Wouldn't you like to send us data? Wouldn't you like to have better mm-hmm. shopping information? So the more of those things you say right. yes to, the more they track what you do and use that to manipulate what ads you see. And so see. much of this is about ads. It's so yeah. much of this is about ads. Well, and I wonder, too, uh, with a lot of those prompts, just how much people uh, think about them whether they just kind of close the window or whether they click yes without reading it. And I just think a lot of people are probably going with the flow and not really understanding what they're giving away. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure no one who listens to this show has ever lied and say they, they've read the EULA, even though they haven't. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's like we're all like passing 35 pages of legal text and saying, yeah, yeah, I agree. Right. Because they would never make us, mm-hmm. you know, agree to something that would be bad. Right. I, I guess the thing is that we want certain functionality and the assumption is we will assume that the advertisers are benevolent that the platforms mm-hmm. are benevolent. And in exchange, they will give us free information and, and services that we appreciate. That, right. That's mm-hmm. a simple Without assumption. Without having to give anything back in return. Exactly. And, and most people think that way. Like, uh, yeah, I'm sure they wouldn't do anything illegal. I'm sure they wouldn't do anything bad. And here's where it all falls apart. Because they're, to be blunt, they're not listening to you. They're I know people have weird experiences where it seems like something pops up. They couldn't possibly know. I definitely didn't search for that. Easter Island and moles and skin tags. But but the reality is, aside from them listening to us, they're also literally observing everything we click. So uh, every website we go to, every social media we go to. That's a concern regarding you. It's a concern. It should be a concern for everyone. <laughs> now, I, I have left social media. I mean, the kind of weird media. things you look up. Well, well, I look up ridiculously dumb things, which is why my advertising suggestions suck. 
Uh, well, I look up weird stuff for my research. So, yeah, yes. I get all kinds of strange things coming up myself. I don't get – to, to be blunt, like, say – so you would think this would be a better technology, but, like, say Amazon, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think Amazon um, is certainly a mixed bag. There's things I like about them. I'm certainly relying on them all the time for all kinds yeah. of things. But, Good and bad, pros and cons. When you buy stuff there, you would think that the most powerful website in the world would have a better ability to predict how to suggest things to you that you want to buy. And what do they do? You buy a toddler swing, and they're like, well, if you have one toddler swing, surely you want to look at these other 97. No, I don't. It turns out if you buy one toddler <laughs> swing, you're probably done. That's it. You, you know? It's, it's spent. Like, <laughs> well, then I have seen on Facebook and uh, other sites where people will – post a screenshot of something strange that was suggested to them by Amazon or, or you know, AliExpress or something like yeah. that. Well, but I, I want to ask you, this is kind of tangential, but I'm just wondering about spam because sometimes I get the, I, I mean, we've all been talking about uh, Viagra spam and all the different kinds that we, we've gotten over the years, but is spam ever targeted? I bet it is, but I have no proof of that. Because mm, it um, sometimes seems to be. Yeah. Well, and other times not at you all. You would have to look at how they got your email address. So, right. Yeah. So, if which they brings us, it from I a think, list or, or something. Well, this is a great example. So, uh, this brings up the concept of data brokers. So, there are, you might call them white hat data brokers. These are people mm -hmm. like Facebook, Google, um, companies that have access to your private information. And, mm -hmm. You click that EULA and agree that it's okay for them to sell that information. So, right. so you're selling your soul. You there's legal avenues where um, advertisers can get into that access and then use it for a lot of things. Sending emails is really funny because there are laws around emails that you're not supposed to be able to send unsolicited sales emails under certain circumstances. Um, obviously, obviously. People ignore that rule because uh, much like phone well, how spam. How could they really police that, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's well, I have thoughts about that. I, there's a whole lot of uh, things that could be gotten rid of if you approach things with a uh, access approval list required. You know, so like you can't email me unless you've gotten past uh, some kind of oh, access. So that's the average person. The, it's tedious. <laughs> right, right. And I've, I've dealt with people who basically whitelist their inbox. And guess what? They don't get much spam. Because most spam systems are not designed to go around that. But then they're also mm -hmm. outliers because they're willing to go to those efforts to clean their inbox. So, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, I, I try to keep mine pretty clean. Uh, but it, it it is difficult. Yeah. So this is a little bit outside the normal Monster Talk content. I don't want to, like, nerd out to the point that it turns our listeners off. But I, I want to point out this thing, which is when you give your data to these, let's call them white hat companies – um, mm -hmm. they can legally sell that data. And guess what? A lot of you probably think, well, the government can't monitor me without a warrant, right? So I don't mm -hmm. need to worry about sending emails to people or talking about things because in order for them to get that information, they would have to have a judge issue a warrant mm -hmm. that says there's mm -hmm. a legal need for them to be able to investigate and have access to that information. Ah, I just think the average person doesn't think this through. Will think that yeah. far. Well, it turns. I just don't out, think they really care yeah. about it. <laughs> well, they may not, and and and. But then again, they're the same ones who are thinking their phones are listening to them, and they're not. They don't have to listen yeah. to them because all that information they're giving away for free is available mm -hmm. to everyone, including the government, without a warrant. All you have to do mm -hmm. is pay for it, and it mm -hmm. turns out oh. that there's black hat data brokers who are hackers who compromise systems and also sell data and they sell to spammers and all kinds of nefarious people. So mm -hmm. your data gets out there regardless. So it's being collected regardless. And if there's a mm -hmm. data compromise, a data breach, then well, it happens all the time, which happens all <laughs> the time, then all that mm -hmm. supposedly innocuous data goes to, dark places on the internet where it's sold and sold and sold and used to populate spam and to promote attacks mm -hmm. and social engineering and all sorts of things. And wow. you what might get targeted web. ads 
from these white hat companies that seem mysterious and like they're fed off of, you know, they had to be listening to me. Like they couldn't possibly know I'm going to New England to go antiquing this week. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I've only told Mm -hmm. my mother and my boyfriend or whatever, (laughs) you know, so it turns out Google search. Also, I Google searched it. Also, I looked on Facebook. Also, I told some friends, you know, and every one of those Mm -hmm. transactions is available to be sold. Right. Mm -hmm. And and, and it's, really obvious though when you explain it when you put it this way it really makes sense that we are being watched we're not being listened to but we're being watched and we're really giving away this information and not thinking about it and i guess uh paying attention to the supposed hits but not the misses exactly yeah it very much falls into that i mean they don't even have to a cold read everything's a hot reading right if it seems Mm -hmm. magical and mysterious it's your fault. <laughs> Somehow it's your fault. Now, the fact – you think about Sherlock Holmes, right? And and in those stories, you know, he looks at a person and suddenly can tell 30 or 40 amazing things about them. Making mm-hmm. the duck. Now, that's just a story. but And some cold reading. And some cold reading. And in this case, what looks like cold reading is usually hot. I mean, they're making strong inferences. I mean, think about it. There was a story that came out, uh, I don't know, it was probably a decade ago, and it was a story about Target. And Target mm-hmm. got in trouble because they were monitoring people's transactions, and from that data, they were able to determine that one of their customers was probably pregnant and sent them mm. a bunch of ads for baby stuff. And the father okay. of the teenage girl got really mad about it because what what are they talking about? Oh, mm, yeah, mm. exactly. And but it turns out, like if you think about it, like Target was real cagey about how they were able to figure this out. And I, for a mm. long time, thought, "Wow, that's so mysterious. I wonder what algorithms are you. What if she just bought like five pregnancy tests? I mean, it's not yes, that yeah. complicated. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, again, it just really. All makes sense when you you lay it out, but I think if you you don't really uh, think about it at all, just on the surface, it really does seem like oh they're they're somehow magically acquiring this information. They're they're listening to us, uh, but I really think that uh, with you talking earlier about the data that's involved and the the collection of that and the storing of that, I think that's a really compelling reason for why they wouldn't be collecting that amount of information um, in an audio Yeah, the, the, right, it, audio would be, uh, first of all, if you ran your microphone all the time, it would run your battery down. You would notice, right? And there's actually mm-hmm. been some really cool research around this where they like did some tests uh, where they did, uh, they set like a control group of phones uh, with everything turned on and then another group of phones with everything turned on so that they could record everything. And Mm -hmm. then they basically played recordings talking about a product to one room and not the other. And they never saw a difference. But more importantly, Mm -hmm. the battery life on both sets of phones was the same. So the phones were not listening, right? That's just There you go. Well, yeah, yeah, that's pretty definitive. But uh, that's interesting. Has there been a... Ton of research into this, or I don't because I've a ton. The- I don't think you have to. I think once you realize how much data people are giving away unwittingly, but <laughs> with permission, it's there's no need, right? You know, if 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 the psychic has access to literally everything you've written, they don't need mm-hmm. to be psychic to, to tell what's going to happen. They could just like go yep. to all the information they have, you know, it's that hot reading. Yeah, yeah. I think that's just the, the best explanation for that. But I have seen with some of the articles that, that are out there, you've got journalists who do these really flimsy, superficial. Oh my God. Yes. Tests. yes yeah. And, Oh, I was speaking to my friend about traveling to Japan and uh, then suddenly I'm awash with ads for traveling to Japan. Uh, and, yeah, it just seems like that there's nothing scientific about that. There's no, nothing it, it's, truly it's, investigative. It's, it's like we are absolutely giving every – and I don't want to call these people villains, but like they're giving everything to the the agency that could send them an ad, like everything mm-hmm. without having to have them listen to. 
but they don't right. think about it, so it's blind to them. And then they're amazed when suddenly they're getting targeted ads for stuff they don't remember talking about except to a friend in a room in real life. Yet mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they rare it's rare that someone would be in a situation where they would be making big plans like that or making purchases like that without doing any mm-hmm. research whatsoever. So, I mean, there will be right. outlier co- coincidences. Coincidences happen. But, but in mm-hmm. general, it's not mysterious. People just aren't aware of how the system works. And, well, and I have to – sorry. I was just going to say, if you, if you enjoy those free services, maybe this is fine. But don't attribute uh, malice to a, you know, to a non-existent agent – when you're mm-hmm. absolutely willingly cooperating with the sort of agents who are in power there. Right. Yeah. And admittedly, there've been times where I have uh, talked about something and then looked it up and then have been targeted with ads and, and have put two and two together, but not really thought about it because certainly there are those other times where it does seem like it's mysterious. And uh, I could see how people could get conspiracy theory about yeah, this absolutely and, and and it's just there's plenty of reasons to be paranoid oh and i would say if you're conspiratorial yeah, think, if you think the government is listening to you here's a fun fact the government now doesn't have to listen they don't need a warrant because these data brokers will sell them the data legally without a warrant and that's absolutely on the record is happening. The CIA, the FBI, they buy data from data brokers absolutely legally and get access to information. They don't need to know mm-hmm. what you were doing at a particular location by tracking you on your phone. They can find out from Facebook or from Google or from Apple that you were in a particular mm-hmm. place at a particular time that puts you in a, a position of being a high suspect, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. And, the hot readings once again, and uh, I guess you've got to know your rights with these things, and I, I just don't think a lot of people do. Yeah, I agree. And now, I mean, there's been some really cool things that have happened in the past, where like uh, the police would have a suspect, and then they would have access to their phone, and they could mm-hmm. do things to the phone under a warrant that would allow them to turn on the microphone. And there were some really famous cases around there and they may still do that Mm. sort of thing. That may be a real thing that still happens. And they definitely have also given away compromised phones for free or, or arranged for them to be given to people who were in uh, organizations that were doing potentially criminal activity. But Uh, again, mm. you don't need a warrant if you can just buy it from a data broker. And if everybody's giving away their stuff for free, you know, that's Cuts just helping. It's helping. It's taking out the middle person. It's taking out the court system. And suddenly mm-hmm. now it's all admissible. You don't have to bother with it. So, you know, hmm. yay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess now, now knowing all of this and uh, digging into this research, do you think that this is going to change how you do things online or not? Well, so there's the you basically have a trade off situation like i i always try to remember to turn off all the tracking that windows does for example mm-hmm. but every right. time i get a major update it just tries to stick them on again it's extremely annoying it's tedious they try mm-hmm. to wear you down so that eventually yeah, you'll yeah, be busy yeah. and you'll just click take the defaults and yeah. suddenly your machine is now telling them everything about everything you do so mm-hmm. and oh let's let's say you're like one of those people who uh likes to have private quality time at night on certain sites, but you don't want other people to know about it. So you open an incognito tab. Oh, we don't have any listeners like that. No, 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 no. (laughs) That would be terrible. So you open up an incognito tab and get to work on your important project. Um, Guess what? (laughs) That incognito tab is only keeping the local copy of the data away. Uh, Mm -hmm. Anybody along the way between your machine and the destination, including the destination, can keep track of everything that happens. Like you might like say, your employer and well, I don't know about your employer, but if you're going, your ISP certainly knows your uh, uh, your schedule, your personal schedule. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they're <laughs> not, doing not anything with that, but like. <laughs> but they have access to all that information. So you know, if, oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think you'd be naive to assume that yes. uh, people. If you, track you. if you think Comcast doesn't know when you like to spend private quality time with your favorite uh, website, they do. They know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. No, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> totally agree with that. I mean, the, the information's out there. So, yeah, there's a, I, I think, uh, 
yeah, certainly a, a certain amount of naivety with a, a lot of people in their uh, beliefs about this. Uh, but I, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought yeah. about how we, we use the internet and what information we hand over and ways to protect ourselves as well. I mean, my best advice would be don't do anything that you wouldn't want to become public because pretty much anything Good you advice. do could become public. So it's that simple, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, then that's, a sure. sort of, that's sort of the sort of moral compass that we assume everyone has, but clearly we don't, right? <laughs> Yeah, people who are impulsive and don't think. Yeah, and you never know what state you're in. I mean, like, obviously, we our brains put us into all kinds of different states where certain behaviors that we would normally never do become things we would absolutely do. So, you know, mm -hmm. you, you at a, you know, a, a Sunday picnic is different from you at a 3 a.m. bar. It's just a different, mm -hmm. you're in different mindsets. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I think the main thing is I wouldn't be afraid of Big Brother watching you. He is. Uh, I, I would <laughs> I would be more – try to <laughs> be aware <laughs> that you're being watched and behave accordingly. And if you want to hide mm -hmm. from being watched, you might want to get off the internet. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Go out into the, the mountains or the hills. And you might have to go into meat space, the kids are calling survive, it. Survive, I mean. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Um, I, you know, we're all being watched all the time in public anyway. I, it's not always a bad thing to be observed. It's just, you, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's important but to keep in I mind. I think the that, majority of people don't really have anything to be concerned probably about. Probably not. Probably not. So I, I think just I don't I just, don't be paranoid about the wrong thing. If you're going to be paranoid, be paranoid about the right things. You know, just mm -hmm. focus your paranoia on things that actually might be happening versus things that you imagine are happening. That That's my advice. <laughs> well, yeah, I think this is a really good skeptical lesson. Yeah. Some good critical thinking here with this. And, and just one of those topics where I think quite a few listeners will. Uh, be like me and just assume that there was something to it. Yeah. And uh, I'm not really emails. worried about it. Too yeah, much. If you want to argue about it, come on over to Patreon, you know, <laughs> <laughs> be glad to have those discussions. So um, absolutely. Yep. And if we need to Bring follow up, up we can, but I, I think this is a nice little introduction. Don't be afraid of your phone, mm -hmm. for, at least not for it to listen to you, but be more conscious about all the things you do and what you click. I agree to, that would be really good mm -hmm. advice. So. Yeah. Oh, good advice, sir. Any way you cut it. As I edited this conversation, I realized that the complexity of the topic really does make it hard to say definitively that our phones are not listening to us. For example, we have services like Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, and Google Assistant always listening. Only, so far as we know, they're listening specifically for activation words and most of that data gets dumped. Would it be possible for those services to hold on to all of that data? Think about how much disk storage it takes to make an audio memo. And now multiply that by every phone and every listening device. And you would see that that would be an insanely large quantity of data. It would burn through your phone's battery. It would take up vast amounts of storage. And it would take tremendous computational power to sort through all that stuff to find stuff to sell and advertise to you. We have a biological bias to assume the connections between unusual things we see on our phone that we've been talking about must be coming from our conversations. We remember speaking the same, and that's an obvious way the phone might have made the connection. But a recurring theme of my decades of skeptical inquiry is that our memories are not reliable, and our brains will make up explanations that are logical, intuitive, and often wrong. We give so much data to these companies through our social networks of friends, our travel being tracked, our search history, and if you use a free email, chances are that your messages are being machine read for advertising opportunities. So can I say with 100% certainty that these companies are not listening to our conversations? No, because we don't know what capabilities they might have that lie off book. But I can say with a high degree of confidence that they don't need to listen to your conversations to know more about you than you'd probably be comfortable with if it were not for the Faustian bargain that we all make to have limitless communication and knowledge in our pockets. Is it a fair bargain? I'd say privacy has been one of the casualties of the 21st century. 
And so long as we are aware of the things we're giving up, it's up to each phone and internet customer to decide if they want to share that much information. This ties into bigger privacy questions like the creation of a surveillance state. We didn't get much into it in this discussion, but we are spied on by our governments. One hopes that these capabilities are used for good, but those spying tools were hampered by warrant requirements here in the U.S. and the fact that the data brokers can sell stuff that we give away to them and that they can sell that information to government agencies seems like a back door being left open to both corporate and government abuse. If you don't want to be tracked and you don't want to be spied on, you're going to have a hard time in this modern world. But finally, here's an excerpt from an experiment by the phone security company Wandera, and the link to this paper will be in the show notes. To test if advertising platforms are listening to conversations through smartphones, we set up an iPhone and a Samsung Galaxy phone in an audio test room with a pet food video playing on a loop for 30 minutes. We also ran a control group with the same two devices in the silent test room for 30 minutes over three days. In our testing, we were looking for two main things. Did the battery consumption, data consumption, or background usage of key applications change during the testing period? Could we see ads for pet food within those apps after the testing periods? We used a cloud gateway to see the changes in data consumption of the apps on the test devices, and we used the device stats to determine background usage and battery usage. I guess for the hardcore media people who say our phones are listening to you, my question would be, can you demonstrate it? Can you prove it? And even if you can't, we're still giving away so much information, so much more information than they would need to listen to us to find. All right. Well, we'll see you next week. Cool. Yeah, we'll be back with more fun Monster Talk stuff and and probably more in line with our our usual topics. But I think that this is certainly going to be of interest to our listeners. And to our phones, which are definitely listening to us. (laughs) (laughs) Monster Talk. You've been listening to Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. I'm Blake Smith. And I'm Karen Stolzner. Somehow I suspect this will be a controversial episode. So many of my friends have had bizarre advertising connections pop up after conversations where certain keywords were spoken that they're impervious to the possibility that the ad might have been based on their search history, their social media activity, or other connections. It's really hard to prove that the phones aren't actively parsing our conversations. The storage issues and computational issues and bandwidth consumption, these things may be overcome in time. The first company that is revealed to be actively listening is probably going to have a PR nightmare on its hands, but thus far that hasn't happened. But the temptation as computational power increases and storage prices decrease might be too much for them to resist. We'll see. In the meantime, I hope that the takeaway here is that if you're using devices to communicate, you should always assume you're being monitored. Not that someone's actively listening but that everything you do is leaving a trail and that someone with access and forensic skills can easily deconstruct it. And the last thing I want to do is encourage paranoia. I just want to remind you that anonymity and privacy are hard to come by in this day and age. And with this topic, we needn't attribute to malice that which can be explained by avarice. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Monster Talk. Each episode, we strive to bring you the very best in monster-related content with a focus on bringing scientific skepticism into the conversation. If you enjoy Monster Talk, we now have a variety of ways to support the show, all with convenient links at monstertalk.org forward slash support. That's monstertalk.org forward slash support. We have links there to our Patreon page as well as a donation button. Another great way to support the show is to buy books from our Amazon Monster Talk wish list, which directly helps us with our research. We love used books very much, so don't feel compelled to buy new ones. And we love Kindles, so we can share our digital libraries with each other. And finally, without spending any money at all, you can support us by leaving a positive review at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Positive reviews help keep us visible in iTunes, which is a great way to help us find new listeners. And please share our show on your favorite social media platforms. Our theme music is by Pete Stealing Monkeys, and we thank you for taking the time to download and hopefully enjoy our show.
This has been a Monster House presentation.